Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah Gardner. I'm the Executive Director of the Fund for Public Health in New York City. For those of you who aren't so familiar with us, the Fund for Public Health is an independent nonprofit. We work in close partnership with the New York City Health Department to improve the health and wellness of the six and a half million people who call New York City their home. We do this by creating public-private partnerships, securing funding to test out new ideas, and working with the health department to launch and expedite innovative public health initiatives to address urgent health issues. The last seven months have certainly been an unprecedented time in our history, in our city. As we enter the fall, we are at a critical juncture as we, try, we work to try to prevent a resurgence in COVID-19 infections. This morning, we've invited you to meet our new Commissioner of Health, Dr. Dave Chakshi, to hear his vision for our city, get an update on the COVID-19 epidemic and our city's response, and most importantly, an opportunity for you to ask questions. Now I'm gonna hand it over to our moderator, Fatima Ashraf, for the remainder of the town hall. Fatima is a member of the board of directors at the Fund for Public Health. Her first job when she received her master's in public health from the University of Michigan was actually at the New York City Department of Health in the Bureau of Injury Epidemiology. From there, Fatima went on to serve as a senior policy advisor on health in City Hall. And now 15 years later, she has experience at all levels of government, in philanthropy, and in the nonprofit and private sector. She currently works as a professor of public policy at City College of New York and has her own consulting business. Fatima, thanks for being here this morning. Over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to have so many New Yorkers on this call today. I'm really excited for us to dig into this very important town hall. And so let's get started right away with the results of our poll. You might remember that when you registered for this town hall, we asked you some questions about your most biggest important concerns related to COVID-19 in New York City. So what we learned from your responses is that 36% of you are most concerned about the city's economic recovery and about 30% of you are most concerned about misinformation regarding vaccines. When you registered, you also submitted some questions for our panel of health experts, and we will get to those during the question and answer section. Now, let's get a sense for where you are all at today and do another quick poll. Here it is, three questions. I'll give you a few moments to read them. The first one is, do you think the city is responding effectively to the recent uptick in cases? The second question, have you been tested for COVID? And the third question, have you had a COVID antibody test? So you all take a moment to answer these questions and we will show you the results in real time of the hundreds of people who are on this call with us today. Well, the results are coming in quickly. This is amazing. We will show you the answers, the percentages in just a few more seconds. All right, here we go. So 66% of you think the city is responding effectively to the recent uptick in cases. About 50-50 on COVID testing, very good to know. And 59% of you have not been tested for antibodies, which means 41% of you have been tested. Okay, so it looks like folks feel that the city is doing an okay job in responding to this ongoing pandemic. And it looks like about half of us have access or at least have been tested thus far. 
So just before I turn it over to our panel of health experts, I want to take a minute to share what you can expect today and a few technical notes. Our new health commissioner, Dr. Dave Chokshi, is going to give a very brief presentation and then the remainder of the hour will be a question and answer session. At any point during this town hall, you can type a question into the Zoom's Q&A feature along with your name and where you are from. You can also submit questions anonymously, so no pressure. I will be asking Dr. Chakshi a combination of questions that came in from the registration forms and also questions that you send in live. We are going to do our absolute best to get to as many questions as we possibly can and of course to answer them. So now I would like to uh, introduce our amazing preeminent health experts from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. First, we have Dr. Dave Chokshi, who was appointed commissioner in August. He also holds the ex officio position in the board for the Fund for Public Health of NYC. I'm personally very grateful for his participation on our board. He most recently served as the chief population health officer at the New York City Health and Hospitals. And he, that's where he built and grew an award-winning team dedicated to health systems improvement. He has taken care of patients as a primary care physician at Bellevue Hospital since 2014. His prior work experience spans the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, including positions with the New York City and State Departments of Health and the Louisiana Department of Health before and after Hurricane Katrina. Dr. Chokshi served on the FEMA delegation to New York after Hurricane Sandy in 2012, and he also served as a White House Fellow and was the Principal Health Advisor to the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. One fun fact that I don't think Dr. Chakshi even knows is that he beat me out for that White House Fellowship, but he totally deserved it. Next, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Torin Easterling, who has been with the New York City Health Department for five years. He was recently appointed as the first deputy commissioner and chief equity officer. We are very lucky to have Dr. Easterling in this role in New York. Most recently, Dr. Easterling was deputy commissioner for the department's Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness Division, where he significantly advanced efforts to reduce overall premature mortality and close the racial gap for leading causes of preventable death. Dr. Easterling also serves as the COVID-19 Incident Command System Lead for Equity Operations, through which he has overseen hyper-local response engagement in communities with low rates of testing and high percent positivity. He is also the co-chair of the Community Advisory Board, which helps advise the Test and Trace Corps and the department's contact tracing efforts. Finally, we welcome Dr. Hilary Kunins, also a board member of the Fund for Public Health, who I love sharing um, this, the, the stage with. Dr. Kunins is the Executive Deputy Commissioner of Mental, health, of mental Hygiene at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH. I'll use the acronym from here on. In this role, she oversees DOHMH's major strategic initiatives to improve the mental health and behavioral health of all New Yorkers. Previously, Dr. Kunin served as Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Alcohol and Drug Use at DOHMH, where since 2012, she has led the department's efforts to promote public health approaches to reducing health and social consequences of drug and alcohol use in the city. As a general internist and addiction medicine physician, before joining DOH, Dr. Kunin worked in the Bronx for 16 years, providing primary and addiction-related care to patients in both community health centers and in substance use disorder treatment programs. Thank you so much, Dr. Chokshi, Dr. Easterling, and Dr. Kunins for joining us today. And I will turn it over to our commissioner to give the brief presentation. Well, thank you so much, Fatima, for that um, really warm introduction. Uh, and thanks to um, Dr. Kunins and Dr. Easterling for, um, for joining me this morning. Um, I'm just uh, just delighted to have the chance to um, speak with all of you about uh, about the important and urgent work uh, that the health department uh, is taking on on behalf of New Yorkers. Um, and uh, our starting point, if we go to the next slide, 
Um, our starting point is to ensure that we are rooted in uh, the values, mission, and vision uh, that reflect both um, how much of uh, the, the history, the lineage of uh, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene um, matches up to this moment that we're in with respect to the public health emergency. Um, my conviction is that particularly in times like these, when we are amidst a maelstrom um, with respect to the public health challenges that we're confronting, that the things that we need to hold on to um, most dearly and carefully are our core values. Um, and this was something that I felt strongly about uh, when, I, um, uh, when I came in in August uh, to be able to name these core values. I, you know, my um, approach was to name what I had already seen with respect to uh, the health department's work extending back over years, um, in many cases over decades and centuries. And those, those core values are science, ensuring that it's truth um, and uh, the pursuit of scientific inquiry and evidence uh, that is guiding our decision making, equity, um, placing at the center uh, the notion that, um, that justice and uh, health justice in particular um, are part and parcel of public health. And then finally, compassion. Um, you know, as Fatima mentioned, uh, I'm a primary care doctor. And I think particularly in this moment that we're in, um, all of our work, whether it's the abstraction of the data that we're doing to the much more tangible on the ground work of public health, um, it, has to be, uh, it has to be linked by the notion of compassion, of being able to walk a mile in someone else's shoes uh, and understand um, the multifaceted challenges that people are experiencing right now. The mission and the vision here are, um, are what have been the mission and the vision of the health department for several years now. Uh, and this just reflects that we will uh, continue um, along that path even as we confront uh, the new challenges that we're facing with COVID-19. Next slide. Um, and so uh, in August, um, we underwent a very rapid planning process to take uh, those core values, our mission and vision, and turn it into a strategy um, that we think of as uh, worthy of meeting this moment. Um, you know, fundamentally, we have to ensure uh, that our strategy and our priorities um, are, uh, are matched to what New Yorkers are experiencing and in so many ways to what New Yorkers are struggling with today. Um, you know, it, it starts with getting the diagnosis right. Uh, so obviously the COVID-19 pandemic is central, um, but we're also seeing uh, how COVID-19 intersects with uh, structural racism. Um, which uh, is another fundamental part of what our public health response uh, should, um, should be centered around. Uh, also, unprecedented social and economic upheaval. Um, and taken together, the COVID-19 pandemic, racism, and that social and economic uh, instability is what we have to um, make sure that our, uh, our response um, is, is actually doing justice to. Um, so that's the uh, kind of the, the bigger picture with respect to our strategic priorities. But we have to get very concrete, particularly when we think about our COVID-19 response, because so much else of what we do, um, our bread and butter public health work, will flow from an effective COVID-19 response. And so our three key priorities within COVID-19 are first, as we'll talk about a little bit more, uh, to prevent or, uh, as we're seeing right now, to try to rapidly mitigate a resurgence in COVID-19 infections. Um, second, to plan and prepare to vaccinate New Yorkers uh, for influenza right now, um, and to use that to lay the groundwork for our COVID-19 vaccination plan, uh, hopefully um, later this year or early next year. And then finally, to address the parallel pandemics uh, related to COVID-19. This um, recognizes that beyond uh, the, the virus itself, there are so many other things that, um, that flow in the wake of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it's um, interrupted care for chronic diseases, 
uh, challenges to mental health, uh, including stress and trauma that so many people are experiencing in small uh, and much more significant ways, um, racism, uh, and, uh, and the social issues that we mentioned as well. Next slide. Um, one of the characteristics of our response to COVID-19 is to be grounded in data. Um, I believe in this both from the perspective of ensuring that we are making decisions driven by data, um, but also because it reflects the transparency that we want to bring to our response. Uh, so these are three public health indicators that we, we uh, put out on a daily basis. Um, when the mayor has a press conference every morning, he goes over these indicators uh, himself and they give us, uh, you know, in, in concert, a picture of where we are um, with respect to our COVID-19 response. Um, these are updated uh, as of uh, this morning, and we can see that cases have indeed arisen uh, over uh, the last several days. Um, our test positivity rate in the top right-hand corner here has also started to go up in the last uh, several days to weeks, although um, appears to be leveling off in the last uh, two or three days. Uh, and then we look at hospitalizations uh, for COVID-19 as well, although we recognize that's a lagging indicator compared to cases and test positivity. Next slide. Um, of course, data is only the starting point. We have to translate data into action. Um, and when we started seeing uh, upticks, not just in those citywide indicators, but in all of the different slices of data that we're able to do at a more neighborhood level, um, we, uh, we sounded the alarm uh, very quickly um, and were able to make the case for swift action. First, by um, showing uh, what our concern was, particularly in these three clusters in Southern Brooklyn, uh, Central Queens, as well as the Far Rockaways, um, and demonstrating that, uh, that the, the way that cases were increasing was out of the ordinary. Um, we did that, uh, I should say, using um, a system known as SatScan, which we think of as our early warning signal. Um, and I just want to point out, um, you know, for those of you who, uh, who know the good work of the Fund for Public Health, um, SatScan is uh, a system that actually came about in support um, with funding from the Sloan Foundation, the CDC Foundation, and the Open Society Foundation. It's a cluster detection software, an early warning signal that allows us to say at the very first signs that something statistically significant is happening, um, it's a chance for us to broach the important conversations about how to turn that into policy change. It's how um, we fostered those conversations first at the city level, developed a proposal to take to the state level that the governor then uh, approved as, um, as what's called the cluster action initiative with the red, orange, and yellow zones that are indicated here. Um, you know, I just want to point out one other thing about this, which is um, we're one of the few jurisdictions in the country that is able to have such refined data that we're looking at this um, at the zip code level and sometimes at even finer resolution for us to be able to say independent of any geographic boundaries, do we think there is something out of the ordinary going on so that we, uh, we can bring to bear resources and ultimately policy decisions to take swift action. That's one thing that we have learned about the coronavirus um, is that because of its uh, infectiousness, because of its reproduction number, um, time really matters and being able to shrink the amount of time between when we see a problem and when we leap into action is critical for our ability to um, try to save lives and prevent suffering. Next slide. Now, this doesn't mean, uh, of course, that we always have to go to the local restrictions that are part of the cluster action initiative. In fact, part of our goal, uh, which is consonant with, you know, really the philosophy of public health is to, um, is to try to do it in a way that prevents uh, you know, those local restrictions from having to occur. Um, this is what we call our hyper-local approach. Um, and Dr. Easterling and others on the team deserve particular credit for, uh, for formulating this over the last several months so that we can, again, at the neighborhood level, when we see either a rising test positivity, 
cases uh, going up disproportionately, or even just low testing rates compared to the rest of the city, we can bring to bear the right resources, whether it's mobile testing, um, redoubling our efforts to spread our core public health messages, what's known as the core four about masking and social distancing, et cetera, actually bringing face coverings to, um, to the ground uh, to be able to uh, support communities in doing this. I'll say two more things about this. One is that um, baked into the way that we do this is uh, humility and a recognition that it is not always a government and the health department uh, that should be um, you know, the tip of the spear with respect to the hyperlocal approach. Uh, in so many neighborhoods and communities, there are uh, more trusted messengers. There are community-based organizations that know their neighbors and their neighborhoods um, and who uh, are highly motivated um, to work with us to try to interrupt the spread. So we always reach out to partners um, when it comes to these hyperlocal responses. The second thing that I'll say um, and uh, Torian and I were actually out this weekend uh, for some of our hyperlocal response in, uh, in Southern Brooklyn in the neighborhood of Midwood. Um, and I'll just share from that experience that um, generally we are met with uh, so much support from the community, particularly when it comes to dispelling misinformation and giving people accurate information that helps clear up confusion um, because there are so many competing messages. So that's another um, core part of our hyperlocal hyper response. Next. Um, just a word about our flu vaccination uh, campaign. Uh, this is something that uh, hopefully you all can see the pin that I'm wearing uh, proudly uh, about having gotten my flu shot. I hope everyone is not just getting their own, but also encouraging their friends and family members um, to get theirs. Uh, what we're saying is that this year's flu vaccine could be the most important one you ever get. That's for several reasons. Um, one is, is that it is worthy in and of itself to make sure as many people get vaccinated against the flu in any season. We know that it saves lives, and we know that it saves lives not just through the individual effect of the vaccine, but the ability um, at the community level to protect uh, those who are most vulnerable um, in New York, uh, whether it's uh, babies or um, people who have chronic disease or vulnerable elderly individuals uh, as well. So it's worthy in and of itself, but we know with COVID-19 um, that there are heightened reasons for concern um, when it comes to uh, people seeking care in our emergency departments and hospitals. This is a way to prevent um, a surge related to, uh, related to influenza. And finally, um, it's a chance for us to, um, to avoid some of the confusion that may occur because the symptoms of influenza and COVID-19 do overlap. Um, so uh, our campaign is organized around a very simple goal, which is we wanna get more New Yorkers vaccinated against the flu than has ever been done before. Um, as with so many other things, this is meant to match the historic moment that we're in. Um, and our preliminary data indicates that we will be able to do this. In fact, um, we're seeing that uh, about 34% more children and almost 85% more adults have been vaccinated um, at this point in the flu season compared to last year. That's almost 175,000 more New Yorkers who have been vaccinated against the flu. So we have to keep up that momentum and importantly, reach into um, our neighborhoods and communities where um, we know there is skepticism about vaccination uh, because often that's where it's the most important to encourage uptake of the vaccine. Next slide. Great, so that, that concludes our, uh, our brief remarks. Um, I just wanna end on this note, which is something that hopefully you've heard peppered through what I'm saying, um, but it can't be said enough, and it is not hyperbolic for us to emphasize what historic times we are living in. Um, I hope, uh, based on all of the suffering and the tragedy that we've seen over the last few months, that this is indeed a once in a generation, once in a lifetime, you know, once in a century, type of moment for public health. Um, but at the same time, we have to ensure that
that our response, the way that we're thinking about confronting these challenging, often entrenched problems um, is also uh, up to that level with respect to um, how we think about pulling out all of the stops, uh, whether it comes to the flu vaccine, responding to a resurgence, preparing for a COVID-19 vaccine, or um, most importantly, making sure that people think about health equity as one of the central things that we have to address um, that cuts across uh, all of those specific initiatives. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Fatima, with my gratitude again for the chance to speak with you all. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Chokshi. Um, I really appreciate, appreciate it in the beginning how you raised this idea of parallel pandemics and I recently saw your new commercial um, from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene encouraging folks to go and see their primary care doctors and to get their checkups in addition to their flu vaccines and thought that was a really positive message. Again, acting in the, in the way of prevention um, as a core value to public health. So let's get to our first question. It is a combination actually of questions that came in from registration and a live question that came in during your talk. Since nearly 40% of people on this call listed the economic recovery of New York City as their primary COVID related concern, the question is, what is the city doing to simultaneously address economic recovery and support public health? Are there public health, healthcare job openings uh, that are becoming uh, open to uh, stimulate and increase employment. Thank you, Catherine Wolf from Chelsea for that addition. And what are you doing to prepare for the future? Um, great, well, all uh, such important questions, very substantive as well. So let's try to dig into them uh, a little bit and I'll invite my colleagues to chime in as well. Um, you know, let me just share a little story um, that sort of brings to life um, you know, how this, um, this is impacting, you know, our fellow New Yorkers lives in a very tangible way. Um, you know, for me, it really hit home uh, toward the end of April, you know, after we had seen um, so much suffering, uh, you know, so, so many people who had severe COVID-19, uh, too many uh, family members and neighbors who died from the virus. Um, and I was taking care of patients at Bellevue uh, as a primary care doctor. And I remember seeing one of my patients there um, who I hadn't seen for, uh, for several months, um, you know, because he, um, uh, because he was worried about coming in to seek care. He was a restaurant worker and, um, you know, he started off our conversation just by asking me, what do you think is going to happen? You know, are we, going to have a chance to get back to work. Uh, I'm really worried about um, earning money to, to make rent and, you know, to be able to feed my family. Um, this was a patient who had multiple chronic diseases. I had been taking care of him for diabetes and high blood pressure, as well as kidney disease for several years at this point. And I remember, you know, feeling so torn with respect to my response. Um, because he is someone who I was very worried about from the perspective of his risk for COVID-19 infection. And from that perspective, I wanted to do everything that I could to avert a bad outcome for him from that perspective. But at the same time, he wanted to get back to the restaurant, you know, where he could earn a paycheck um, and do all of the things that he needed to do to earn a livelihood which of course also affected his health, both his physical health and his mental health. Um, and so I think that, you know, encapsulates the, the, um, the tug of war, you know, the challenges that we face when it comes to thinking about health, both from the public health perspective, as well as the economic recovery perspective. But it also leads us to the conclusion that we have to really challenge this false dichotomy which continues to come up in conversations about public health and the economy. Um, I believe very strongly that the path to our economic recovery, particularly when we think about it in the medium term and the long term, is through the most robust public health response that we can possibly have. Economic recovery flows from public health. And those of us who uh, are fighting for the things that we know need to happen with respect to 
preventing more suffering um, from COVID-19 have to be, I think, very, um, uh, very uh, insistent upon this point that these are not either or choices. These are things that we have to do in public health to be able to support an economic recovery. I'll just say one other thing before I hand it off to my colleagues, which is the other lens that I try to take on this, again, reflecting that we are in such a historic moment, is that when we look back on um, what has happened in New York you know, over the centuries, um, we've seen, uh, for example, in the 19th century when there were cholera uh, epidemics that really ravaged the city in the 1830s and the 1840s, um, primarily uh, affecting people who were lower income, uh, primarily affecting immigrants to the city. Uh, and we, we you know, feel so many echoes of that, uh, of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic. But one thing that gives me hope is that in the wake of those uh, cholera and typhus epidemics, that is where the metropolitan health laws, the Board of Health, uh, you know, that, um, that continues today, um, really a lot of the foundation of the health department came from. Uh, and it came from this idea that if we take our public health response and particularly lift up how, um, uh, how we think about it affecting low-income New Yorkers and make that central to our recovery, um, you know, that is something that, uh, uh, that we should hold in mind as our goal for what has to happen, not just today and tomorrow and next week with our response, but planting the seeds for a more robust recovery um, in the years to come. Uh, so let me pass the baton maybe to Torian, who has also been doing a lot of thinking about long-term economic recovery and how public health is central to it. Sure. Um, thanks, Commissioner. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, what the Commissioner just laid out, uh, I think is really important and critical of not separating uh, sort of our public health response, this pandemic, uh, in the parallel pandemics uh, to our, our economic recovery uh, and some of the discussions that we've been having uh, with our economic development uh, corp colleagues uh, and others within SBS and within uh, academic uh, spaces, sort of thinking about how we can center uh, our public health response, but also center uh, the response that we have to, to mount against uh, racial injustice as well. And so centering those two uh, and making them sort of the nexus of our uh, long-term economic recovery plan. Uh, and most recently, uh, the mayor announced sort of a collaboration and sort of the direction uh, as a city where we want to go around this long-term economic recovery plan. But, you know, you heard a little bit about our COVID response, uh, and I think it's going to be really important uh, that part of our response is also ensuring uh, that we're thinking about uh, you know, our communities, um, and particularly individuals who have continued to work during this pandemic. And so thinking about the essential workforce and how are we are ensuring that both testing capacity as well as uh, when COVID vaccine is available, how we're going to ensure that individuals who have been working and coming from uh, black and brown communities are continuing to have access to these resources. And more robustly thinking about our research as well, uh, so that we're continuing to stay on the cutting edge of not only COVID-19, but other uh, emerging infections uh, throughout this world and country. Uh, and I think we're gonna have to continue to sort of be at the forefront as a city. We've learned so much during this pandemic. Uh, and I think in order to protect uh, the future of our city, uh, we're gonna have to really build out, uh, uh, you know, sort of that model. And I think that will be an opportunity for us to think through our collaborations, uh, not only with government, but also with academic partners, uh, you know, foundations. Uh, and so many of you, uh, how we should be thinking about this collaboration as well. Uh, and, and you also mentioned workforce. Uh, we currently have uh, over 4,000 individuals who've been supporting our New York City test and trace uh, workforce. And uh, majority of them are coming from the communities that have been hardest hit by COVID-19. We have learned so much uh, and we have to continue uh, to cultivate uh, not only this public health workforce, but also the experts that are coming from these communities. And so finding ways that we can plug them in, uh, but ultimately they will be the leadership uh, for, for many of the public health institutions as well. And so I think there's great opportunity here and uh, we're certainly looking forward uh, to really sort of solidifying 
uh, this plan. And I think that we, we've started some really good discussion with some of the folks uh, here, you know, at the fund uh, and also um, other partners as well. Thank you both so much for that incredible answer to this important question about economic recovery. It cannot be overstated that economic recovery requires a robust public health response. And what Dr. Easterling just described, economic recovery also requires that our most marginalized communities have health and stability. So our next question is from George Burke. And the question is, COVID-19 has affected people's mental health. How can and how should the city and its provider systems be responding? Yeah, let, let me start and then turn it to, um, to, to Dr. Cunnins, who has been thinking about this um, you know, so deeply over the last several months. Um, this is one of the parallel pandemics that we are uh, both most concerned about, um, but also you know, most motivated to, um, to try to address through the various means that we have. One of the ways that I think about this is that, um, you know, through the appropriate focus on all of the physical suffering, you know, that has happened due to COVID-19, uh, and particularly the, the, um, the catastrophic uh, ways in which uh, uh, deaths, you know, affect uh, our families, our communities, um, these are things that uh, it's, um, we have to get behind the numbers to understand, you know, precisely how uh, how the reverberating effects of, of what's happening affects people's mental health. Um, you know, again, I, I think about some of the patients that I uh, have taken care of who, uh, again, particularly after March and April, were, um, were going through so much bereavement um, for family members, you know, for neighbors, uh, and you layer on top of that the stress and the trauma um, that people are experiencing both directly um, from the virus, but also because of, um, of you know, the unemployment associated with it, um, the challenges of juggling so many responsibilities, you know, working parents, uh, juggling childcare, and, um, and the stresses pile up upon one another. I think one hope that I have, even as we confront uh, people who um, who need the services, you know, uh, that that we're able to provide, is that this um, this enables us to further our agenda of destigmatizing uh, mental health um, in a way that allows everyone a window into how important uh, you know mental health is to how we think about health writ large. Um, we don't. Uh, often enough talk about public mental health as a fundamental part of public health. Um, and I, I hope, again, that'll be one of the lasting impacts of this pandemic. Um, but let me turn it over to Hillary to say a little bit more about what we're doing in this space. Uh, thanks, Commissioner, and thanks for uh, that question. Um, so in, to just build upon uh, both what the commissioner just said and, and also the prior question, we know similar to, to improving physical health and going upstream, taking a public mental health approach means similarly going upstream to address folks' uh, mental and behavioral health. So for example, we know that uh, economic and financial insecurity affects people's mental health. Uh, we know this from surveys. We recently put out a report uh, that's posted on our DOHMH website showing unsurprisingly that many New Yorkers feel financially or economically insecure and in patterns that replicate other racial and economic disparities and inequities in our city. So we know that addressing economic and upstream factors is actually a pro-public mental health approach. So I don't wanna leave that out as I turn to some of the specific things that we're doing that you might more commonly think of as, as, ment as supporting mental health. Um, uh, the city is taking a broad approach. One sort of key um, approach to post-disaster mental health support is normalizing people's experiences of stress, anguish, anxiety. Most people feel those things in the setting of a disaster or in the setting, in this case, of a pandemic. And that is common, but mostly people get better. And I think that's 
really an important key point here is that by normalizing and destigmatizing these feelings um, uh, is part of the road to recovery. And we are doing that through a number of strategies, public messaging, um, public awareness, and in our priority communities in New York City, we are uh, undertaking something we are calling 3C, uh, community conversations about COVID, mental health, resilience, and equity. Uh, and that we are available and doing many, many virtual presentations with many New Yorkers across the city, particularly focused on neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID. We also have, as I hope all of the audience knows, uh, a free confidential 24 seven accessible helpline called NYC Well, uh, which provides crisis counseling support, peer support and referrals to needed mental health services. And finally, I'll just mention uh, lastly, um, that we in the mental health space also rely on FEMA support. And in this case, uh, FEMA provides uh, a structured crisis counseling funding, uh, which will be soon is in the process of getting stood up in New York City to make crisis counseling available uh, in, in addition to the other services that we have available in our uh, fairly robust mental health system in New York City. Great, thank you for that, Dr. Cunnins. It is a silver lining of this pandemic if an outcome is the awareness uh, and importance of, pro, of public mental health um, increases. So our next question is from Shayla Michelle, and it is, what has been learned from contact tracing and how can we better educate the public about the importance of compliance? Yes, this is a this is a terrific question, and you know one that um, one that we have uh, gained more experience in over the last several months. Uh, you know, in partnership with um, with the Test and Trace Corps, uh, which is a, a collaboration between New York City Health and Hospitals as well as DOHMH. Um, the first thing that I'll say is that uh, contact tracing in New York City is occurring at a scale that has never been seen before. Um, and it's at a scale that is significantly larger than, um, than uh, almost every other place across the United States and most other places around the world. Um, contact tracing in and of itself is so important to help us interrupt the spread of COVID-19. Just the fact that we are able to reach out to people, um, give them guidance about how to isolate or quarantine, and then link them up with resources to be able to do that successfully, whether it's access to a hotel or you know, specific things that, um, that will enable them to uh, better isolate or quarantine at home. That is an intervention in and of itself that is really important and that it can't be stated enough has helped us uh, keep the number of cases lower than it would otherwise be. But more directly to the question, you know, what have we learned? Because the other part of contact tracing is for us to, um, to gain information, you know, particularly about exposures, um, particularly about what it is that um, we may need to be doing differently with respect to our public health response. What we're finding is that, um, you know, the most common uh, reasons for, um, for people getting infected with COVID-19 are, um, are related to exposures to, you know, to other known cases. Um, and, you know, that, that might seem common sense in and of itself, but that means that generally transmission is occurring in smaller groups in places like, uh, you know, workplaces. Um, within families, you know, at small social gatherings. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of household transmission as well. Um, so, uh, you know, so that's also important for us to recognize um, how important it is when someone is diagnosed uh, to ensure that they are isolating from, uh, from household members as well. Um, beyond that, you know, we, we continue to learn about um, specific ways that, um, that contact tracing should inform our broader public health efforts. Um, one that I will just highlight is, uh, is the importance of getting testing out to where, um, where people still don't have enough access to testing. 
Uh, you know, that is something that we can glean from the interviews that, that are being done, uh, number one. Number two, making sure that we keep a pulse on the highest risk settings. So for example, as we uh, are going through a limited reopening of indoor dining, it allows us to see if we're encountering clusters related to restaurants um, that can then directly be fed back into our regulatory approach with respect to ensuring that those settings are kept as safe uh, as possible. Um, and then I think the final thing is just to, to make sure that um, we have a pulse on misinformation that may be spreading that is contributing to, um, to, uh, to uptakes in cases as well. So those are the major learnings thus far. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, a great segue. We're getting lots of questions about vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines specifically. Uh, how are we going to handle the misinformation around a vaccine? When a vaccine does become available, how will we ensure that it is equitably and effectively delivered to marginalized groups like incarcerated or homeless folks? And what is Additionally, on top of that, the current plan for addressing COVID among these groups. How will you encourage vaccine adoption? Thank you. Uh, another great series of questions. Allow me to start uh, and then pass a baton to Dr. Easterling. Um, so we are, um, and we have been, working around the clock over the last several months to plan and prepare for uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, there is a lot that remains uncertain with respect to, you know, the, the specifics of the vaccine, which one will make it through phase three trials, um, what will the safety and efficacy data look like, um, what groups, you know, will be prioritized in different phases for, um, for receiving the vaccine. Uh, and so a big part of our job right now is to monitor that and to develop plans based on that information as it emerges. Even as we do that, um, we know that there are some core uh, parts of, um, of vaccination that we will have to address. And again, we're using our flu vaccination campaign this year um, to, to try to get at some of these and to try to uh, address them um, you know, even before there is a COVID-19 vaccine. So let me lay out a couple of the things that we're talking about. Um, one is, um, is making sure that we have the most robust communications plan possible. Um, doing it in a way that saturates, um, you know, traditional media, social media, trusted messengers um, to be able to get the word out about a COVID-19 vaccine when it becomes available. That's number one. Number two is more operational. How are we actually going to leverage the infrastructure um, that we have in New York City to get the vaccine to as many people as, uh, as quickly as possible? Um, I will say, you know, because of the, uh, the terrific um, staff that we have at the health department, uh, we're able to stand on the shoulders of, of efforts in years past. Uh, we have something called the citywide immunization registry, which puts us light years ahead of many other um, cities with respect to being able to track vaccine uptake and understand exactly how we're doing, uh, you know, in different populations and different geographies. Similarly, we work very closely with um, healthcare providers, uh, you know, with respect to sharing information with them um, and working through any supply and distribution problems that they may be encountering. So there's a whole set of operational issues around it as well. And then the final um, bucket, of course, connected to, to the first two is um, the equity considerations. And let's just be very frank here. This is a, this is a major concern. All of the evidence that we have um, shows that there is uh, skepticism about a vaccination in general, but then particularly about a COVID-19 vaccine um, in certain communities uh, among black New Yorkers, among Latinx New Yorkers, uh, among immigrant communities, you know, related to some of the anti-immigrant um, sentiment that has been too pervasive over uh, the last several years. Uh, and so these are things that we will have to confront both in terms of how we roll out our communications and our operations, but also thinking much more creatively about who the trusted messengers are so that again, it's not just us, not just government or even 
um, you know, traditional healthcare providers, but others who can, uh, you know, who can bring the messages in a way that they resonate, um, that they resonate differently. A final thing that I'll say before I turn it over to Torian is to say that, um, you know, a big part of how we're going about this is to um, leverage the relationships that already exist in many of those communities with the hyperlocal responses, um, you know, with our healthcare providers. For example, we've been helping uh, healthcare providers around the city by giving them testing resources so that they can actually do tests in their communities rather than us bringing a mobile, you know, testing site, for example. So taking those strategies that we found successful uh, for um, the COVID-19 response and adapting them to vaccination as well. Over to you, Torian. Thank you, thank you again, Commissioner. Um, I'll just say and start with, uh, for us to be truly successful here, and we're, we're looking to implement and execute the same process as we uh, you know, think about our flu vaccine campaign, uh, we have to acknowledge the harms. Uh, we have to acknowledge the skepticism, uh, particularly in black and brown communities and other communities uh, around science. Uh, and, you know, we have data uh, at our disposal, uh, but we, we certainly need to lean in into the uncomfortable conversations uh, and make sure that we really have buy-in from our community partners. And here's how's we, how we've been thinking about it. You spoke about the equitable uh, allocation framework. Um, we brought uh, the framework uh, to some of our partners through coalitions we've already established uh, to think through this framework, think about the populations that we really need to prioritize, not only just healthcare workers, but the communities that have been most impacted um, in, during the wave one. Uh, and how do we go about that process? And I think that's going to have to really show our collaboration uh, with our community partners. We have a number of CBOs who've been funded through Test and Trace and been working with them to help get out the message around test, testing and the importance of face mask uh, adherence. And I think those are the same partners, uh, as the commissioner had talked about, trusted messengers who will help carry the baton around making sure that we're, you know, um, uh, really making sure that individuals know how important it is uh, that, you know, getting their flu vaccine, but also uh, also getting the COVID vaccine is going to be um, part of it. And we're going to really have to think about our infrastructure as a city uh, and really expanding that infrastructure to really incorporate our partners. Uh, the commission talked about our pharmacies, our healthcare providers, but we certainly know uh, during wave one that there were non-traditional uh, infrastructures that were stood up, barbershops, beauty salons, to really ensure uh, that they were really getting social services, critical services uh, to individuals. And so how do we leverage some of those uh, traditional, those non-traditional partners as well uh, during uh, something as important as a COVID vaccine when it's, when it's available? And so I think, uh, you know, certainly going back to the, the equity lens here, it's going to be really important to be successful. Thank you so much to you both for that extremely thoughtful and multi-tiered answer. I just want to underscore um, and, and thank Dr. Easterling for naming the historic harm that must be considered when we think about misinformation and also discomfort around taking vaccines. And Commissioner for so emphatically stating the importance of partnerships outside of government agencies um, in order to make our vaccination program successful. So our next question is related to voting. How can we insist that voters wear masks at polling sites? The Board of Elections has instructed poll workers that voters can in fact refuse to wear masks. Yeah, we're very actively um, making sure that, uh, that voting is done as safely and uh, in as healthy a way as possible. Um, our department recently put out um, guidance, uh, citywide guidance, with respect to um, precisely what that means, both at the individual level as well as, um, you know, for polling sites themselves. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, the, the decision about wearing a mask is one where we have to um, think about it as what is going to encourage behavior change. Um, when we look at the science of behavior change, um, norms become so important. So the more the rest of 
uh, you know, the people who are at a polling site or really any other place are wearing masks, the more likely it is that others will wear masks. So I think we have to broadcast these messages, um, you know, work with our, our partners, particularly the Board of Elections, to ensure that the guidance that we've put out about universal masking, distancing at polling sites, um, and uh, uh, ensuring, you know, the use of hand sanitizer, uh, hand washing, um, that all of those things are, are implemented. Um, you know, in, in many ways, it's akin to the work that we've, we've been doing around school reopening, where we have found that when you saturate the messaging, when you think, talk about it in a way that emphasizes how important this is for health, um, you are able to create those layers of safety, you know, that allow it to be, um, to allow it to be something healthy. Uh, give, give me a chance to just link one other point to this because it's one that I feel particularly passionately about, which is that voting is a, a public health activity. You know, voting is, is good for our health. Um, exercise is something that, uh, you know, you're used to doctors talking about a lot, um, but let's put a little twist on that and talk about exercising your right to vote um, because it is so fundamental to the upstream factors that both Dr. Cunnins and Dr. Easterling have talked about that tie to the patterns of illness and health that we see in our society. So if we're serious about addressing structural racism, if we're serious about affordable housing, if we're serious about the things that we know tie to nutrition in our communities, then all of that ties back to um, ensuring uh, electoral participation, uh, ensuring that, um, you know, that people have their voices expressed through uh, the civic process. So as an agency, um, we have thought uh, long and hard about everything that we can do, not just on the sort of more technical aspects of voting safely, but also to encourage voting as something that is actually health promoting in and of itself. Thank you so much for ending on that extremely important, positive and activating message. Uh, huge thanks to you, Commissioner, to Dr. Cunnins, to Dr. Easterling for joining us today. We are just about at 11 o'clock, so I wanna close with some important messages. If you liked what you heard and you feel inspired to support the health department's effort, please get in touch with the Fund for Public Health of New York City. The best way to support our incredible researchers, scholars, and activists at the health department is to support the nonprofit partner that helps to move forward their innovative health initiatives and pilot programs to keep all of us New York City residents healthy. If we didn't get to your question, we will do our best to follow up with you personally or provide resources in the follow-up email. There will be a short survey on the screen once we end this webinar. We would appreciate if you would take a minute to provide us with your feedback. We really value hearing from you. We're always looking for opportunities to improve and we do expect to do more of these in the future. So your feedback will be great in helping us develop them. We will also follow up later this week with the recording of this webinar for you to share far and wide and another link to the survey if you don't have time today to do it. Thank you so much to all of you for your incredible questions, both at registration and live. And we look forward to doing this again and to seeing all of you soon. Take care. Fatima, may, I, may I say one more note to close? Of course, Commissioner. If you'll allow me. Um, well, I, I usually close my patient encounters with a list of things that we agree that, um, you know, that we'll do at the end of the visit. So, um, so if you'll indulge me, I wanted to give um, the folks who are so gracious in sharing their attention uh, a checklist of, um, of things to do over the coming days. I noticed that only 50% uh, of, of uh, the poll participants have, have gotten tested recently for COVID-19. So um, number one is get tested. You can go to nyc.gov slash COVID test. Um, and I'll just make a plug for our uh, COVID Express Labs, where you can get your test result within 24 hours. So number one, get tested. Number two, please get your flu shot and encourage others in your family to get your flu shot as well. Help us spread that message. Um, number three, on the voting theme, make sure that you have a voting plan. It is so important this fall to ensure that you get out and vote. And then number four, um, just take a moment uh, sometime this week to ask 
uh, someone, it could be a loved one, it could be a coworker, how are they doing? Um, people are carrying such burdens right now. Uh, and so a little bit of human conversation, particularly when we are all virtual in this way, um, can go a long way. So just my short checklist, thanks for allowing me to, to state that. Thank you, doctor. Better we end on your checklist than anything else. Have a great day, everyone. Stay safe, get tested, go vote. Thank you.